So hello and welcome to the first of the fall 2020 semester in the research and application series webinar from UNCG libraries. These webinars are 30 minutes and they're about different things about research. So sometimes they're about databases. Um, we have some about data, um, data visualization, um, all kinds of things to do with research. And today we have Leah Leininger, our health science uh, librarian, one of the health science librarians, uh, talking to us about thinking about health information. So these are 30 minutes, they're recorded. Uh, I am helping to moderate in the chat. So if you have any questions throughout, feel free to put them in the chat. If there's a nice pause in the presentation, um, I will, uh, you know, alert Leah, but if not, we'll kind of save them to the end. So without further ado, Leah, are you ready to go? Absolutely. Thank you so much for introducing me and thank y'all for joining me, whether it's live. I'm so pleased to, to see some folks online here. I recognize some names. So yay, hello from afar. And if you're watching this afterwards, um, thank you also for giving me your time and taking part. So I am the liaison librarian to several of the health sciences at UNCG. So I do library orientations and instruction for those areas. I also meet with those students and instructors when they need advice on finding health sources. And today what I'm gonna talk about is, as you see on the title of the slides, which I'm putting in chat, thinking about health information. So one thing that I want everybody to go away from this just feeling is that, or knowing, <laughs> science is not a set of facts. It is an iterative process. So I know this is a little counterintuitive. For me, as an information consumer, if I read in a nutrition textbook and maybe some popular articles that eggs are not good for me, I should not be eating eggs. And then a few years later, I read, eggs are a great source of nutrition. Everybody should have, you know, introduce eggs into your diet. My first reaction is, whoa, back up. That's a complete reversal. Well, don't worry. Science is not broken. Scientists are not being dishonest or, you know, misleading about this. The fact is, researchers obviously are going to be um, doing their work. They're going to be disseminating their work, hopefully first to other researchers, at which point those other researchers will um, you know, look at what has been done, look at the methods, look at the data, they'll give feedback. Sometimes they see problems and they'll call out the author on, or the potential author on what they're seeing. Um, and sometimes they don't, but no matter what, other research continues. So maybe the, the current topic of research is replicated and, and the, the findings are, are um, sort of held up, um, maybe not. Either way, as time goes on, other research is going to be done. Current understanding of the topic does change. So remember, y'all, science is a process. And this goes true for communication, science communication as well, including health information. So these are the topics that I am going to be covering today. I am going to end up demonstrating a source of health information. It's one of my favorites, but we're going to have some chats before then. First of all, of course, I am not a doctor or a nurse. Um, so if you ask me, what does this mean? Or what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> I cannot interpret that for you. I can advise you on where to find information that hopefully will be useful to you, but I can't interpret information. Also, I am not a professional health educator. So, you know, chances are I might misspeak during this presentation. Um, that's just, you know, sort of a, a hazard of presenting information please don't interpret things that I say as current health guidelines or anything like that. Um, another thing, the health topic on everyone's mind is COVID-19. It's still not well understood. A lot of the information is still being investigated and debated. And a lot of the research that is out there is what we often think of as lower level. It's sort of initial observational research. So that's something to keep in mind as we go forward. So just a little basic information about communicating findings. I know I alluded to this earlier, but just so we all know, many researchers often share their work first with other researchers, maybe at a conference, maybe through a preprint, maybe through peer reviewed articles in the journal for their specialty. Um, and as I mentioned, 
they're going to get some review, they're going to get some feedback, hopefully there will be some replication, and we see other studies coming along to confirm or correct that information. Later, the best available evidence is tailored to other audiences. So maybe there are guidelines for healthcare practitioners, maybe there are um, guidelines for public health officials and, and uh, you know, legislators and so on and so forth, and even just member information for members of the general public. But even at this point, um, this information is not the final word on whatever topic it is. Sometimes problems are found with a research study or multiple research studies, and as I mentioned, new research always leads to well, I should say that's a little, that's a bold statement, but new research does lead to new understandings of the, of the science. So just to pause for, for a sec, um, I want to know what sources you like for health information. And if you are, for instance, a graduate student, just to throw out an example, um, you know, you might have very different sources that you like for getting health information for yourself and your family. So just if you could go to this address and I will put it into the chat and give some responses. So where do you like to go to find health information for yourself and your family? And I am going to go away from the uh, presentation for just a little bit to look for responses. So again, sorry, this is this is a little back and forthy, but um, the link is in the uh, in the chat. So we've got a couple of responses. Um, so we like Google and the healthcare provider in our family. That's that's fair enough. I start with Google a lot of times. Um, we've got CDC, North Carolina DHHS. Lately, the COVID-19 UNCG dashboard, yes, I, I have to say yes. I wanna find local information, work site information about what's going on. That's, I agree with that. And of course, I'm always a fan of the, of the CDC and within our state, um, coronavirus information, how it's playing out, also policies, procedures, things are in place. Um, community Campus Partnerships for Health. That's interesting, I have never heard of that. Um, that sounds great. Uh, so I'm gonna bookmark that. I'm gonna go look that up. Um, I see People's Pharmacy. I like People's Pharmacy too. A, the radio show where a couple of pharmacists get on. My husband and I sometimes uh, make fun of the sponsor a little bit, <laughs> but, but uh, it's, it's enjoyable. And also it can be helpful to have different perspectives on something. So I'm also seeing NIH, National Institutes of Health. Yeah, for sure. And, and I do see um, sometimes social media, I try and evaluate it, especially if it's shocking. So true. There is so much information being disseminated on social media. Um, so I don't know, what do y'all think about these sources? If you wanna chat any of your reactions to them. Um, I'll say for me, I, gotta, I gather information on social media and on Google. Um, one of the things to be, I guess, mindful of when we're looking at social media is where did that, the information actually come from? Who produced it? Um, is the, is, is the kind of disseminator of the information, whoever created the message, are they very far removed from, from the source, maybe, um, original research or, or multiple research studies? So yeah, there are there can be a lot of different sources of information. And if anybody feels like chatting about that, y'all go for it. If you have questions or suggestions, let me know. I'm going to go uh, back into the slides. But just so you know, I'm perfectly comfortable with the back channel kind of communication, so. So a couple of examples of sources and some of these you're probably already familiar with. Um, some of them you might not have paid too much attention to. Um, you might see some health information and just think, oh, it's from a peer-reviewed article. It, it is about a research study or it's a news article that mentions a research study. I'm good to go. This information is solid gold. It is the definitive answer forever and ever. Yay. 
That's um, unfortunately not quite always the case. So just things to point out, preprints have become really big recently. So those are preliminary reports. That's a way for researchers to um, post a draft of their research study online to share with others um, quickly so that they don't have to wait for the six to 12 month publication <laughs> process for a peer reviewed article. One thing to keep in mind, there has not been independent review. There hasn't been peer review of the preprints. So during the um, pandemic, scientific communication has sped up a lot. Preprints, the, the use of them and the posting to them has just exploded. It's become huge. But keep in mind, they are preliminary. It is easy to misunderstand or misuse them. And if you feel like following some links in these slides, I give a couple, I give an example, a couple of different sources about um, how a preprint was posted um, by researchers affiliated with a major university. Um, and there were some people who wanted to politicize, I will say politicize um, certain restrictions, travel, wearing face coverings, that kind of thing. Um, and they picked up on the preprint within hours of it being posted before other researchers could comment on it um, before it was even published. And all of a sudden, there were rumors, there were gossip. A lot of um, general consumers sort of took the information to be true. And there was basically COVID. Oh, it's just like the flu. The fatality rate isn't that high. It's not that dangerous. So this, um, this misperception is still circulating out there. So um, if you want a couple of examples or a couple of perspectives on that example, the, the links are in the slides. Also the peer reviewed article. So of course, we think of those as just the gold standard because it's a publication that's had um, editorial scrutiny, but also review by other researchers, hopefully in the, in this, in the field of science, the same field that the, the researchers are in, um, and hopefully multiple, uh, multiple peer reviewers. But you know what? there can still be issues found with a research study afterwards. So peer reviewed articles can be corrected or retracted. And over time, as I mentioned, it's just normal for new research, especially new types of research to, to come up with new understandings. So don't assume because I looked at a peer reviewed article that this is the complete and final answer on this topic. Researchers all the time say, look at multiple sources, preferably um, you know, what does the body of research say? Multiple sources, not just a research study. And I know that's hard if it's something like, um, well, a, a really new disease uh, because the research is, is sometimes on some parts of it, there, there's not a lot, but overall, it's good to look at multiple research studies. And of course we have press releases, which those are positive and they're, enjoyable and they're fantastic. You see these kind of newsy blurbs about um, our, the researchers at our university are doing this amazing work. They're having a, such a good impact on the community or um, the drug that our company is developing is going to change lives and we're doing this great work. It really is kind of adver kind of promotional, kind of an advertisement. Ideally, the press release is going to come after um, the researchers have actually made their data available to other researchers after um, independent researchers have scrutinized that data. So um, there have been cases, and this has happened since forever, it, it just has. There have been cases where a company or a group does science by press release. In other words, the only information available about some claim that they're making, a product, a, a research study, or whatever, is the press release. There's no, there's no um, published data or methodology underlying it. And that is so frustrating to researchers. And also, it's, it's kind of misleading. So watch out for science by press release. It's great to share the good things that the researchers are doing. But um, there needs to be independent scrutiny and, and information made available. I'm going to pause for just a bit because I've been talking a lot. Does anybody have any questions up to this point?
Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm gonna zip right along <laughs> and keep telling you my point of view on all of this stuff. <laughs> there will be a chance for questions at the end as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about things that um, I think you should look for when you're evaluating a source of information. And whether it's a community health website, whether it is social media, um, certainly, you know, anything, you know, even the CDC, even the NIH, the NCDHHS, any source that you look at, what is the source of authority for the person or group that is providing that information? Do they have credentials or experience related to the topic? So maybe they have that direct experience. They are a researcher or a specialist in that area. They're an epidemiologist or perhaps they're an economist talking about um, the economic impact of things that are going on. Does their expertise match with what they're talking about? And perhaps their expertise is as a professional communicator. So science journalists are so incredibly valuable always, but especially now because um, they do that investigative journalism to provide context on how the current study fits in with the overall understanding of a topic. They will investigate and add information on pros and cons. They will usually, if they're doing a really good job, they will get an independent point of view, uh, an outside researcher, an outside expert to say some words about the research that they're discussing. So science journalists are fantastic and educators, they're important too. So the, the, the group or, or um, folks providing the information, do they have some kind of, some kind of authority, but don't stop there, okay? Um, just because somebody has authority doesn't mean that the information that they're providing is correct. Everybody can have a bad day. So experts make mistakes. Sometimes, especially when the speed of science communication uh, picks up, when the news cycle accelerates a lot, mistakes are made. Um, also, people disagree. Um, I mean, they have honest disagreements. So just one authority, but don't stop there. Of course, think about the source you're looking at, how current is the information. And I'm sorry, I can't tell you, you know, this is how current it should be because it varies by topic. Um, I used to, I used to um, when I worked with some of the health science students, I'd say, okay, past five years, that's really the cutoff. That's just a rule of thumb that people have used since forever. But when you're talking about the novel coronavirus, it's you know maybe this week, maybe last week. Um, or if you're talking about something like uh, quarantine measures or stay at home measures, who has the authority to to put this into place. If you're looking at that kind of information, actually some of that, some of that information has been the same for quite a while. So you don't need to make sure it's been updated in the past week, you know. Uh, but anyhow, currency is important and it does depend on the, the content that you're looking at. Um, and of course, look at the text. Does the wording seem informative or persuasive? You know, go easy to read and, and encouraging is nice, but you know, informative is, is good too. Um, and of course the background information. Most important verification. You need to do some verification of the information source that you're looking at. Which sources were used? Um, is that information given? And if you're looking at social media or consumer health messages, there's usually not a references list, but sometimes there are clues that you can use to track down the source of the information. And if you can't, then go out and find other sources, other trusted sources, and see what they have to say on the topic. So don't just see, does this link work? Oh yes, there is a study that exists, and that's what, that's what the message I'm talking about is referring to. Look at that study and, and make your own determination or look at mul the multiple studies they're referring to. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's important because it's really easy for the message to get lost in translation, especially now. So there are some really nice sources for health information. Um, one of my favorites is medlineplus.gov. Um, it is a free health and wellness information portal from the National Library of Medicine. So anybody at all can click into it and use it. It is indexed by Google. So if you're just searching Google for something like 
I don't know, kidney stones or athlete's foot, some of the results that you see will be from Medline Plus. Um, I like it because it's just a, a health content set. Instead of going out to Google and sort of taking your chances, you just get right into Medline Plus. I trust it because it's from the, the National Library of Medicine. It's ad free. It's written, excuse me, the content on the site is written from say sixth to eighth grade reading level. It's written to be easy to understand. There's information in multiple languages. So it's a good source for me. And if I'm trying to um, honestly help students on a brand new topic, it's, it's really nice. And I put a little more information about it um, on the slides here. And I'll show you what it looks like in real life. So this is, this is it. So we're talking about clarity of information, for one thing, or clear, clarity of, of communication. One thing that I like that Medline Plus is doing, they're very clear about saying COVID-19 is an emerging, rapidly evolving situation. Get the latest information. And they suggest the CDC, they suggest a page. Get the latest research and they give a page. So again, um, they're pointing to to resources from the CDC and NIH, which is nice. I like the fact that they acknowledge that Medline Plus, every single topic in there is not updated every single day. Yes, they're regular updates, but not daily. So they're saying, go to these pages. Um, and you can see just if you're interested in, you know, whatever information, obviously, these are for the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, you know, try these links sounds like you were already aware of these sources but you know Medline Plus is good for other topics very good so basic information on wellness topics um, medical conditions uh, drugs medical tests that kind of thing you can um, either browse through some of this information or you can search so I'm just gonna do um, a search for kidney stones because I'm interested in learning about it. Oh, yay. Thank you, Medline Plus. You noticed that I misspelled that. Did you mean kidney stones? Why? Yes, I did. So over on the side, it talks about, um, or the side column sort of summarizes the results that were found. So if I want to find out about drugs and supplements, I can click into drugs. If I want things in multiple languages. I can click there. Um, of course, there are medical tests. I can learn a lot. If there is an overview, usually that's put right at the top. I'm going to click on read more to go to the health topic um, from Medline Plus on this. So I see links that take me down the page to a lot of good information. We've got a summary. There's a medical encyclopedia on one side. Um, symptoms diagnosis and tests. And you can see some of the sources that it goes out to. This is a portal. So there is basic information on this site. Also, it links out to other sites that have been vetted for transparent communication, clear communication. Um, but so some of them are government agencies or organizations, National Library of Medicine. Some of them are maybe healthcare provider organizations. So we get American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, National Kidney Foundation, so um, sort of a, a, a health advocacy group, um, and so on and so forth. Statistics and research, which I like, I always like the statistics uh, that reference desk. There's even, uh, you know, find an expert. So there are um, sort of medical directories embedded in here. And of course, patient handouts, if you want just a basic summary in different or various languages. This one, a lot in Spanish. So this is a, a fantastic source. I recommend it when I'm talking to um, just the general public about finding information. I also recommend it to students in the healthcare professions because it's fantastic when you're starting on a new topic or if you're gonna be working on health education and you're gonna be working with the general public, it's good to know about this source. Okay, so I do want to point out something else. 
which is we actually have a guide to health information from our library. So a lot of our guides tend to be um, focused on this specific class um, or this overall subject, um, sort of curriculum based, but we also have lots of guides on just general topics, competencies, skills, information. So this is a guide on health information. And this was created so that we could use it both when we talk to members of the general public who are not affiliated with UNCG and um, just for finding health information talks when we talk to students or employees at UNCG who actually have that iSpartan account and they can log into subscriptions. So you'll notice um, across the top of the page, of course, there's a tab on evaluating health information. There's also a tab that's just free health information. So this is, you know, when we Anybody can use this, but we, we do emphasize this page when we're talking to people who don't have the, um, the iSpartan account. And of course, we have so many library resources. And many of our subscriptions tend to focus on the research and the curriculum, but we do have sources that have basic health information. And this, um, so the resources that say UNCG library are the ones that are gonna be helpful if you want just general health information. And they do require a login. And of course, we do have a tab for other libraries, because if you do live in North Carolina, you can get an NC Live account through your public library or through the state library. And you can get other things. Um, at UNCG, we incorporate the databases from NC Live among our other subscriptions. But, you know, if you're graduating or if you're moving on or if you are a member of the public who's not currently affiliated with UNCG, this other libraries tab is going to be useful as well as the free health info. So to summarize, science is most definitely a process. Please use multiple sources when you are getting health information and think about those sources. Who is creating and disseminating it? Um, where the information came from? What stage? the information was at. Oh, okay, good question. Just curious why the LibGuide is a .com rather than an edu. Um, I'm not completely sure. This is a, I will give my guess on this. Um, the, the library guide, the library guide system that we use, it's called LibGuides. We actually use a commercial system. We purchase um, basically kind of a GUI interface where we can post content. And it's a commercial company that creates the system where we provide the content. I think that's right. I don't know if Sam has additional information on that. That's my- No, nope, that's right. <laughs> I mean, okay. <laughs> We pay a company called SpringShare um, that runs the company that um, creates LibGuides. It's just a really easy um, kind of website interface that we can quickly link to our databases, link some, have these profile pictures, uh, integrate our chat. Um, so that's it. So that was a really good question. I think I'm guessing we probably have a library and information sciences student on this call. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but does anybody have other questions as well? I mean, here I can, I will say that I would be very, oop, sorry. Let me flip back. Um, I would be very open to feedback if you have it. Um, I will put a feedback link into the chat. So if you have a few moments to, to give feedback afterwards, I would love that. Oh, sorry. Okay. Somebody, somebody just corrected, correct, or, you know, said, no, not LAS. So just a, somebody who thinks very carefully, which is great about the sources of information, how they're being disseminated and, and where they're coming from. I shouldn't assume that you're in my discipline. Okay, so as people are thinking about questions, um, we're right at 1030. Um, let me put the 
webinar link in here. So this, app, this series is called Research and Applications. Um, so that is the link I put in the chat. That is where the recording lives as well as other things we've done in this series. If you're interested, Leah has done a couple of great ones on um, health related information. So the next one we have coming up in this series is on September 16th at 1 p.m. Um, about the Oral History Metadata Synchronizer, OHMS, Better Access for o Oral Histories by Aaron Larimore, our UNCG University archivist. Um, then we also have another series called Online Learning and Innovation uh, that I'll drop in the chat that has a different sign up. And next week um, on August 27th at 12 p.m., we're gonna have someone from ITS, Audrey Berkeley, talk about video platform options at UNCG. Um, so we have a variety of things coming up in that one as well. Um, so if you're interested, you can sign up. You will get a link to this recording after it processes probably um, you know, later today. Uh, and uh, we also will send you a quick link to an evaluation. So please fill it out if you have a chance to let us know what you thought. So are there any final questions for Leah as we are wrapping up? So somebody did send a question to me privately, not posting to the entire room. The question was, does medlineplus.gov offer health statistics for other countries or just US? That is a really good question and I am not certain. So I will say that in Medline Plus, uh, the statistics are often links uh, that go out to US agencies. So we see here kidney stone statistics for the, for the US from yeah, well, whatever. This is so this is US based. Sometimes you can get statistics from other countries by clicking on this and clicking around on the website that comes up. And if you are interested in statistics on a health condition for another country, I will just say um, that honestly, the quickest way, and this is sounds a bit silly, but the quickest way that I usually find to get statistics is to type a health topic and the geography that I'm interested in. So you know, perhaps kidney stones and India would be a Google search. And there's a possibility that a source would, would come up for that. So if, you're, if you are looking for that, that is a search that I would do. And there's another private question. I'm not sure I understand it. So the question is SDOH resources, question mark. I'm not, I'm not quite following. Can you give me a little more on that? Oh, social determinants of health resources. Oh, okay. So, is, so your, so I guess your 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 question is: Is there information on Medline Plus specifically about social determinants of health? We can find out real quick if we do this. Um, but this certainly is not the only place that I would look at for social determinants of health. This is MedlinePlus.gov or or the LibGuide. Okay. Oh, I'm seeing. I see. Okay. Um, so yes, if you if you are curious about researching the social determinants of health, um, there might be some information on Medline Plus about that. It's um, typically more consumer level information about health conditions and interventions. Maybe they have something on social determinants of health at this point. I haven't searched it there recently. On UNCG Library Resources, this is a mix of sources. We are, I mean, our, our mission in the library primarily is to support the, the research going on at UNCG. So while we have sources like Health and Wellness Resource Center that's going to have consumer level information, many of the sources like Access Medicine, um, Credo Reference, they are gonna be a mix and they will include um, information that people would typically use for their coursework, like maybe encyclopedia articles um, or whatever, or, or researchers. I, I very much hope that the researchers are including basic background sources on things like what are some social determinants of health. So yeah, I'm going to say yes, there is going to be a source on UNCG library resources that talks about social determinants of health. I know there are a lot of links there, so if you want um, to get more information, if you want help with your research, talk to a librarian, okay? You can ask me. I can, my contact info is in the slides. 
I'll make some quick recommendations to you. I will probably also ask which department you're in at UNCG. So is there a program you're in? Is there a group that you're associated with? Because I will want to connect you with the liaison librarian for your department as well. So I hope that helps. This could, I mean, there's a lot of exciting information online about social determinants of health. Um, and this tab is a place where you could start, but we have so much more. Does that, did that answer your question? To the extent that it's possible within 60 seconds. Okay, all right. Okay, great. Are there any final questions? Okay, I did my 10 second pause. Um, <laughs> I'm working on practicing. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, happy Friday. I hope everyone has a great weekend or as great as possible in uh, these times. And um, thank you. Thanks, Leah. I'm going to close out the room. Okay, thank you. <laughs>